talking about have we seen Proxima C? And of course, taking listener questions about all the beautiful things in this universe, because that's what this show is about. We record every Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern, and you can follow along online or leave a voicemail at spaceradioshow.com. And in today's Blue Shift, I'll be talking about Simple Ain't Easy. But first, the news. Hey, space cadets, welcome to Space Radio. I'm Paul Sutter, astrophysicist at Stony Brook University and the Flatiron Institute. And for the next half hour, your agent to the stars. We've got an exciting show for you today where we talk about all the coolest stuff in this universe and sometimes even the next universe. This show lives on listener questions. We record every Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern here in Spaceman Studios in New York City. So you can leave a voicemail at spaceradioshow.com to get your question on the air. And you can follow along live with our space cadets tuning in live from around the world. World, from Darmstadt, Germany, from Athens, Greece, from Pell City, Alabama, Kempner, Texas, Trinidad and Tobago, Tobago, Chicago, Trinidad and Chicago, of Wroclaw, Poland, Glen Burnie, Maryland, Ireland, Austin, Texas, Marysville, Washington, Colorado, and San Francisco, California. That's right, Space Cadets tuning in live. They're going to hit me up with questions for the next half hour, and I'm going to answer a reasonable percentage of them. Seriously, folks, I've prepped less than 10 minutes of show material. So if you don't send me questions, it's just me making fun of Greg. And nobody wants that except for Greg. So get those questions in. Hey, Space Cadets. How's it going? It's been two weeks. It's been too long. Oh my gosh, it's time flies when you're sitting around and all the days merge together and nothing just, wow. You guys hanging in there? You guys hanging in there with the whole uh, lockdowns and quarantines and distancing? It's a, it's a, it's a tough world, but luckily... The Spaceman Studios is my home office anyway, so very little has changed in terms of production for me. But Space Cadets, get your questions in. Got a pretty cool news story. Pretty cool news story. Uh, I see your question, Matthew DeFleury. We've got some voicemails ready to go. I have not previewed them. Usually I like to preview them to make sure no one's like swearing on the air or anything or just going off on a weird rant. I have not previewed any of them, so it's going to be an adventure. James Webb, you want to talk about James Webb? We can talk about James Webb. All right, but let's get this new story out of the way. Before I start taking calls, I wanted to say hello, welcome back. It's been a couple weeks. I had to take last week off because I was recording nonstop all week long. It was an adventure. I was recording the audiobook version of How to Die in Space, my new book, coming out in bookstores nationwide and Amazon, out online retailers, everybody. It's coming out June 2nd, and yes, there will be an audiobook version, and yes, I did narrate it, and yes, all the snarky, lame jokes and puns are in there, verbatim, read aloud by me as my director was cracking up. Also, there was a lot of burping involved. I The director warned me that this is going to happen. This is my first time reading an audiobook. And it's hours and hours and hours of reading. There is so much belching involved. Like just air come, it gets in me from weird places and comes out of me in weird places. I I don't know. I asked, the it's not going to happen. I asked if the intermission of the book can just be a super cut of 15 minutes of me burping because... Wow. Anyway, in the meantime, there's been some pretty cool news happening. Uh, So you know that the nearest neighbor star to the Earth, uh, Proxima Centauri, is a little less than four light years away. And a few years ago, there was, or sorry, a little more than four light years away. It's had a pretty exciting observation a few years ago. We discovered an Earth-sized planet in the habitable zone of that star. That star is a tiny red dwarf, so it's not like you're, you can't even see it with the naked eye. This is a very strange system. It's nothing like our sky 
here on earth there's not a white star it's it's just different out there at proxima in the proxima system for the past couple of years, there's been suspected another planet orbiting Proxima Centauri. We call it Proxima C. It's not confirmed. It's not confirmed. It's, in fact, it's far from confirmed. We suspect that this planet is there uh, from the wobbling of Proxima itself, from the star itself, uh, the gravitational wobbling as this planet orbits the star. <sighs> The challenge is that Proxima as a star itself is constantly varying in brightness and it's not it's not very clean, it's not very regular, and so it's hard to tell what's what's shifting of light because a planet is in orbit and shifting in light because the star feels like shifting in light. So those results are a little bit contentious, but a different group claims that they have a picture of Proxima C. A picture of Pro Proxima C, usually it's hard to take pictures of planets around other stars because the stars are bright and the planets are not, so there's a little bit of glare. But because Proxima C is really, really close, the Proxima Centauri system is really, really close, they were able to block the light from that star. Again, I'm, I'm looking at the picture right here on my computer screen. I'm not seeing it. They're saying, yeah, it's right over here. I don't know. It just, it looks like more space fuzz to me. It just, it just looks like noise to me. Skeptics are saying, guys, you just took a picture of noise. What are you talking about? The controversy continues of whether there is a second planet orbiting Proxima Centauri. Supposedly this picture is supposed to help, but I'm not, I'm not feeling it. I'm not feeling it. But that's the latest and greatest when it comes to space. I'd be happy to talk about more if the space cadets are interested. Uh, but let's let's have a conversation. Wow. Will I go see JWST launch? Ooh, good question. Thank you, Nancy Graziano, again for wrangling all the space cadets. Yeah, yeah, okay. We're going we're gonna to go rogue here. We're going to do a voicemail that I have not screened. And so just everyone, cross your fingers with me. And if, if it suddenly cuts off, you know why, okay? You know why. We all know why. I'm nervous. I'm nervous. We got voicemail ready to go. Hey, Greg, I know it's been a while. You're a little rusty, but go ahead. Play that tape. Hi, Paul. My name is John. Uh, first of all, thank you for everything that you do on Space Radio. The program is just excellent, and I look forward to it every week. The question I ha have for you is about dark matter. You know, it seems intuitive to me that this dark matter that we're looking for in the universe is probably just matter that's inside of a black hole. And the black holes are the holders of, of this matter uh, because, of course, matter can neither be created nor destroyed. Uh, as black holes suck in this matter, wouldn't it make sense that that's where the dark matter lives and we don't see it because it's inside of a black hole and nothing can escape from a black hole? Just wanted your thoughts on that. Um, again, it seems intuitive to me, but maybe there are some reasons why the uh, physics – astrophysics community isn't uh, talking about this very much. We'd love to hear your thoughts. Thank you. Oh, wow. Thank you, John, for that amazing question. Thank you for all the compliments. I just have a blast. I would do this show if nobody watched it because I just enjoy doing it. Uh, it'd be a little bit shorter, I guess, because there wouldn't be any questions, but I would still do it. And John, this is a very cool question. This is a very common question. This was up for big debates uh, back a few years ago. Um, or I want to say by a few, I mean, you know, 20 or 30 years ago about the nature of the dark matter. If you're not familiar with dark matter, there is a component to our universe that does not light up. It's not all hot and glowy. A better name for dark matter would be invisible 
matter, okay? And uh, it's estimated around 80 to 85% of all the matter in the universe is dark. It is not lighting up as stars or dust clouds or nebulae, which are also dust clouds, or uh, galaxies or anything bright that's nice and obvious in a telescope eyepiece. No, most of the matter of our universe is simply dark or hidden. It's hard to see. And this question comes up all the time, especially early on when once we first realized that dark matter is a thing. We didn't know if dark matter is normal matter that is just dim and hard to see, or if it's a new kind of matter, a new kind of particle that's previously unknown to the standard model of particle physics. One potential explanation for the dark matter is black holes. Black holes obviously don't give off a lot of light, obviously kind of hard to see, obviously might be a bunch of them, obviously might explain all the, the missing matter in our universe, the hidden matter in our universe. For almost, in almost all cases, black holes are not going to be the dark matter. The reason is you need a lot of dark matter in the universe, not just a little bit, right? You need, for every star that you see, you need five or six stars worth of dark material. You need a lot of stuff locked into the dark matter. And if you put them inside of black holes, if you just say, okay, there's just gonna be a whole bunch of black holes, we're cool, this fails two experimental tests. One of the experimental tests is we can't see black holes directly, okay? We can't see them directly, but if we're staring at a random star, sometimes that black hole, a random black hole might just cross our line of sight. And through gravitational lensing, we'll see distortions of the light from that star. And we can build surveys that look at a whole bunch of stars all at the same time and look for these little, uh, these are called microlensing events, these distortions caused by an intervening black hole. And when you do this, and we've done this, you can get a census of how many black holes are out there and what their masses are, and it's just not enough. If you want the black holes to be the dark matter, they, there have to be so many black holes in the universe that we should see these microlensing events all the time. Instead, they're very, very rare. So that says like, no, there's, there's not enough black holes out there. The second reason, the second observational test that this fails is that Black holes form from the deaths of massive stars. That is how you fashion a black hole is from a big star collapsing under its own weight and creating, leaving behind a core of a black hole. And there simply isn't enough raw material in the universe to make that many black holes from the collapse of massive stars. We know how much normal Regular matter is in the universe. We know this through our studies of the cosmic microwave background of the early universe. We've pinned that number. We said this is the maximum number of amount of stuff allowed in the universe. There simply isn't enough stuff to turn into stars, to turn into black holes, to be responsible for the dark matter. So that's why this is not a favored hypothesis. After the break, after the break, I'll tell you one possible route out of this, but it's a very, very slim chance. Uh, speaking of breaks, I'm Paul Sutter. This is Space Radio, and this show is brought to you by you. I know times are tough, so don't sweat it. If you can't su support the show, it's okay. I'm not going to judge you. I get it. I get it. Trust me. But if you can, it is greatly appreciated. Uh, Greg would like to step up from the store brand mac and cheese to the craft mac and cheese. He'd like to he'd like to do that. I'd like to have that for Greg, but I can only do it if you could support the show and you do that by going to patreon.com slash PM Sutter. It's a platform where you can contribute just a couple, few bucks a month and keep this show going along with all of my other outreach and education activities. That's patreon.com slash P-M-S-U-T-T-E-R, and I'll see you after the break. Yes. Black holes in space cadets, you know I'm about to talk about primordial black holes, right? That's where I'm going with this. John, fantastic question. Thank you, John. 
And thanks. I'm glad you like the show. Glad you like the show. Pulling up the questions from Nancy. We've got a lot going on. Yes. Oh, we're going to do it. Welcome back, everyone. I'm Paul Sutter, and this is Space Radio. We've got more questions ready to go from the Space Cadets, but remember, you can and must join the conversation by going to spaceradioshow.com. You can leave voicemails or join the Space Cadets live on YouTube and Twitch. Now, before the break, we I was talking about John's question about could the black holes be responsible for the dark matter? And I said, look, there isn't enough normal matter. There are too many black holes, or there's not enough black holes out there to be responsible for the dark matter. There is a route out. The root out is something called primordial black holes. In fact, I just recorded an Ask a Spaceman podcast episode about it. It will be coming out in uh, June, I think. Whatever, whatever. <laughs> I'm working ahead here, folks. Um, it, eventually, there'll be a nice, full, long, half hour long episode uh, on askaspaceman.com about primordial black holes. Short version, it's possible in the very early universe, I'm talking when the universe was less than a second old, to make a whole bunch of black holes and just flood the universe with black holes. Still, you, we have a lot of questions about, okay, if the universe did this, there's still a lot of observational constraints. It's not entirely ruled out, but it is extremely dis favored if that nuance makes sense it's just it's really really hard to have a universe full of black holes okay that that's ultimately the answer to john's question now speaking of the space cadets they've got so many fun questions starting off with matthew de Fleury over on youtube asking uh can we talk a little bit about the fermi paradox sure why not i love talking about the fermi paradox here's the deal we're an average planet around an average star in an average galaxy. There's nothing special about planet Earth. We also have life. Life exists on planet Earth and it is the only known example of life on a planet. But if we're average, if we're run of the mill, if we're boring, if we're not special and there's life here, then that means there has to be life other places. There just has to be because we're nothing special. If the universe did it here once, it did it a bajillion places because there's like 40 billion Earth-like planets around sun-like stars in our galaxy alone. So life should be common. So where is everybody? Why isn't anyone picking up the interstellar phone? Why don't we see any evidence whatsoever for any other extraterrestrial intelligence? Hence, paradox. Life should be common, but it isn't. What's going on? Maybe life gets filtered out somehow. Various creative people have come up with various mechanisms that make life rare, starting from the assumption that life is common and then somehow intelligent life is very, very rare. My perspective on the Fermi paradox is that we humans are not truly equipped to handle the enormity of time and space when talking about interstellar distances and intervals. The distances between the stars is so crushingly large that we might as well be alone. There are, I suspect, this is my own opinion, this is my own opinion, I suspect our galaxy is teeming with life. But it is so spread apart that we might as well alone. We're not alone in the galaxy, but we are effectively alone. Larry Beckham over on YouTube is asking, uh, Stephen Wolfram is in the news with a new website. He has what he claims to be a new kind of math. And he's claiming that this new kind of math is revolutionary. It is able to explain and uh, has the power to explain all sorts of physical phenomena and also mathematical concepts all wrapped up in, in fancy mathematical jargon that I'm not going, going to get into. Larry is asking me to, to talk about this. This is not the first time that Stephen Wolfram has proposed a a new kind of reality. I want to say it was like 10 years ago he came out with a book. And honestly, what he's studying is something called cellular automata. 
these kinds of algorithms, these kinds of mathematical structures are very useful and are very powerful. Other people have also worked on it. He, it's not like he invented the concept. I'm sure he's made some advancements in the con in the concept in terms of mathematics. They are useful in studying certain physical phenomenon, but um, as as a tool for explaining the physical world, it's uh, okay. It's useful in certain limited contexts, like every other branch of mathematics. That's that's the most positive thing I can say about Stephen Wolfram's work. For no reason, over on YouTube is asking when they finish James Webb Space Telescope. Don't say that because every time you say that, they're going to delay it by another month. Do you think I'll be making a trek out to the launch site to watch it take off live? Uh, if I believe right, it's going to be launched out of French Guiana. I'm not 100% sure on that. I think it's going to be launched by the European Space Agency, but I could be wrong. Uh, if so, I'm definitely not making it down to French Guiana. If it's launched from Cape Canaveral, I don't know. I feel like I'm going to jinx it. I feel like my presence there is just going to ruin the whole thing and it's going to blow up on the launch pad and there's just going to be tears at the end of that. So maybe it would be best if I took a step back. Uh, Jay Hapgood on YouTube is asking, when will we get detailed images of exoplanets? I mentioned this Proxima C at the beginning of the show. This fuzzy little like speck in a picture that's claimed to be an image of a planet, we do have better images of other exoplanets. They look like fuzzy little blobs. They're not the most impressive looking things. We are getting better and better at taking pictures of exoplanets. We have a satellite orbiting right now called TESS, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey something. It's so hard to keep track of these acronyms, folks. Um, that's going to be very good at taking pictures of exoplanets. Uh, James Webb might be able to if they install what's called a coronagraph, which is uh, something to block the light from the, a distant star so you can get a picture of the exoplanet. We're getting better and better with bigger and bigger telescopes. I don't know how long it will take before we can see like continents and oceans and clouds. I would say if I had to ballpark it, like we're 20 or 30 years away from that kind of capability. Moving on. <sighs> Moving on from the space guests, we got, I've got time for one more question. Um, people are following up. The space cadets are following up with the black hole question. We would have seen big black holes or a bunch of little black holes with gravitational lensing, and that's exactly right. If the universe is littered with a bunch of black holes, we would have seen, him, seen them through their effects on everybody else, through the bending of light as we're looking out at the distant stars. And we don't see it. So we know we have a limit, an upper limit on how many black holes inhabit our universe. And that's it. It's just not enough to be the dark matter. By the way, our best guess for what the dark matter is, is some sort of new exotic particle previously unknown to particle physics. What is it? I'm shrugging. Oh, you can't hear me shrugging. This is me shrugging. Anyway, thanks for all these amazing questions, Space Cadets. Uh, we're almost out of time today on Space Radio. Before, before we go, it's time for the Blue Shift. Okay, Larry. Uh, glad I could help, Larry. Um, what a, oh, yeah, that thing. Yeah, the whole Stephen Wolfram thing. I mean... It's like every 10 years he comes out of his mountain hideout and says, I've revolutionized physics and mathematics. And everyone's like, you go, Stephen. In the meantime, while you're in your secluded mountain hideout, we've, we've advanced the state of the art. <sighs> his, uh, yeah, Rob, um, his AI is brilliant. His work is amazing for sure. He, he's, he's an absolute genius. Has he revolution? He's made my point is he's made this claim before that he has a better understanding of reality than everybody else, that he has a better grasp of uh, physics than 
physicists. He's made this claim before. And after like six months of everyone being all excited, everyone's like, oh yeah, it's AI, it's cellular automata. It's useful in certain applications. Meanwhile, we're going to go back to Maxwell's equations and Einstein field equations. It could lead to something more powerful and useful, but it's going to take a long time to convince me. Yeah, Nicholas, I think you're right. I should read more so I can prepare. Maybe next week we'll do we'll do more about the Stephen Wolfram thing. Maybe next week. <laughs> Beth, tell us how you really feel. Oh, you you get it. You you get the real me. I'm Paul Sutter and you're listening to Space Radio and this is the Blue Shift, my opportunity to get a little bit closer to you. And I titled this Blue Shift Simple Ain't Easy. This is one of the most powerful lessons I got when I was just a little astrophysicist, an undergraduate student, physics major at the California Polytechnic State University, where I got my undergrad degree. I remember one of my professors saying, oh, I've got a homework problem for you, I've, uh, yeah, blah, blah, blah. It's, it's simple, guys. It's simple. And yeah, I forget what the homework problem was, but it was just simple. And it was impossible. We came back the next day or the next week and we all complained uh, that this, we can't do it. Like this, it's a simple problem. And we're like, and you know how undergrads can get, they're all whiny. Uh, Professor, you said it was simple, but none of us know the answer. And he said, no, I intentionally told you it was simple, but it wasn't easy. These are two different things. And I think a lot of people, uh, when they're faced with some of the questions that scientists are answering, or asking, they think, oh, that's a simple question. Why is it taking them so long to get an answer? Like if we go back to John's question, the voicemail, like why isn't the dark matter made of, is the dark matter made of black holes? That is a very simple question. That's a very simple question. It's a deceptively simple question. It took decades of work with many different kinds of observations and many different kinds of theories before we were able to arrive at the conclusion that dark matter is probably not black holes. It took decades, thousands, tens of thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands of hours of effort to answer a very, very simple question. Is the dark matter made of black holes? Simple ain't easy. And in fact, some of the simplest questions we ask about the universe are some of the hardest to answer because that's just life. Sometimes simple, sometimes simple is easy. Sometimes complex is hard, but you're never guaranteed. And the simplest questions can hide some of the nastiest, nastiest surprises. Just a little bit of food for thought. Already over. And unfortunately, this broadcast is almost done. Thank you for joining me on this voyage of space radio. Once again, I'm Paul Sutter, and this show is brought to you by you. Please visit patreon.com slash PM Sutter to get to help make this show possible. Thanks to Greg Mobius for producing, even though I make fun of him all the time. Nancy Graziano for wrangling the space cadets and all the fine crew at WCBE Radio 90.5 FM in Columbus for making this show possible. Catch the live stream every Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern, and you can visit spaceradioshow.com for all the links and show notes, place to leave a voicemail, the whole deal. You can follow me on social media at Paul Matt Sutter is my handle on all the channels and thingies and doodads and of course thanks again space cadets for listening i'll see you next week and remember science is for sharing end of transmission Whew. there's cheese don't worry guys we got cheese is right here i was saving it we're not at the end of the show that was the end of the broadcast that was the end of the broadcast but not the end of the show because you know you know you live streamers get a special treat that nobody else gets. They don't get this on the radio. I'm going to bring it over here. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Don't go yet because this is the best part. I reward myself. I say, Paul, if you do an entire space radio show, you get to eat a new kind of cheese. And I'm very excited about this kind of cheese. I'm so excited about it like, because I, I don't know how to pronounce the name. Ergalia 
U-R-G-E, and there's a diacritic over the E-L-I-A. It is from Catalonia, the sometimes want to be independent part of Spain. Like, oh, we want to be independent sometimes when we feel like it, but I'm not sure. Is that the one? But anyway, they make their own cheese. They clean, This say is semi-soft. It also says it's aromatic. And it's from the Catalan Cheese Corporation. They got their own flag on there and everything. Look at that. Here we go. I have no idea. It's pasteurized cow's milk cheese. And uh, they got some preservatives on the rind. It's a very, very uh, soft, semi-soft. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna break out my cheese knives. Here's James, everyone say hi to James. Uh, get this label off. This looks very interesting, the smell. Ooh. Wow, that's different. Check it out, guys. So the first note of the smell I got was very like Gouda Adam, like a typical a semi-soft cheese, but then distinct distinct farmhouse notes like 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 a little bit of <sighs> have you ever walked into a public bathroom that hasn't been clean for a few days like that odd mix that yeah so strong like first impression is like adam gouda like something very very yummy and then there's this undertone this is making me nervous of like ooh, it's got something to say we'll see a lot of cheeses uh are horrible to smell but yummy to eat so here we go very easy to cut stick them on three here look at that it's a semi-soft cheese. It's a very, you can see there's a little bit, whoops, sorry. A little bit of stuff on the rind. Here we go. Yeah, let it air. <laughs> air it out a bit. Oh my gosh. It's gonna stink up the room. Here we go. Hmm. Wow. Mmm. Uh, mm, uh, uh. Mm. I don't know. Mm. Uh, yes, no. Ooh. No, definitely. Was this bad cheese? When was this made? Did I wait too long again? No. Mm. Cheese is fine. Started off great. This, those those earthy, stinky notes. Uh, when you start tasting them, they like melt with the cheese. Like like Limburger is like you know once you once you actually get it in your mouth, it's fantastic. But then that faded away, and then it was just like it was just peeing in my mouth. It was just oh gosh, is there Galia Catalan for for pee urine? I don't know. I'll see you next week, folks.